Welcome, everyone. Uh, today, we are very excited. We have a, a special guest. Uh, his name is Ron Healy. He's a business leader with uh, a lot of um, expertise and um, you know an impressive uh, uh, range of um, uh, positions that he covered uh, in um, uh, yeah many different uh, verticals and many different uh, industries across Ireland, uh, UK, and also Italy. Uh, so welcome, uh, Ron. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you, Luca. My pleasure. Today we're going to discuss about innovation and we're going to also discuss about, you know, how innovation changed in, across the last um, uh, two decades. We're going to also focus a little bit more in the last uh, couple of years where, you know, for the pandemic, for, you know, a number of um, uh, different uh, uh, reasons, uh, uh, you know, the, the landscape really changed and uh, uh, research and development and the role of uh, innovation in the world uh, really has changed and uh, um, evolved so rapidly. But without further ado, uh, Ron, I would like uh, you to uh, introduce introduce yourself uh, uh, and um, share a little bit more about uh, your experience from the beginning. Um, <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more where you started? Um, I always find this question very difficult to figure out where I should start because I've had, I suppose, three or four different lives in, in as far as in professional career is concerned. You know, I spent nine, ten years living in London and as a, a bus and coach driver and a transport manager and then a route planner and logistics and so on. Um, I spent many years in retail, um, in retail management. I spent a period of time as a student uh, in my mm -hmm. 30s and 40s as a, doing a degree and then a master's um, and published some research, invented some patents, became a lecturer. Um, and so that was another period of life. Um, and then in, I say about 10 years ago, um, I quit academia and went back to the baseline, basement in uh, business analysis, product owner, product manager, product innovation. Um, and um, I suppose the, the, the niche uh, that kind of goes through it all is regulation and compliance on one side. It's my, it's my key um, area of interest, but innovation on the other side. So when you clash the two of them together, it, it forms a nice little niche. So my pretty much my last 20 years has involved compliance and regulation of some sort and innovation of some sort. That's very interesting because, you know, let's start from the end. Uh, innovation and regulation. Yes. These are really two forces that are pulling on the opposite directions, aren't they? Actually, no, I find them the opposite way. I think people are afraid of regulation um, because of the dangers and the costs and, and the potential... Um, liabilities and risks, I see innovation as, well, since this is going to happen, how do we best make use of it? So, you know, f f my, my current area of interest is um, customs regulation because of the customs mm -hmm. changes happened last year. Um, and the, my future area of interest is um, reporting regulation for people in the gig economy because of what happened since COVID. Um, so these regulations come, the world has to change. So how do we innovate to meet them? Previously, my areas would have been Payments regulation, um, GDPR, you know, data protection regulation, um, transport regulation, from my experience as a transport manager. Um, and in fact, even in one case, one of my clients was uh, one of the US state governments. And my role in there was to innovate their actual legislation process. So that's about as close as you can get to legislation and innovation at the same time. <laughs> Automating and digitizing the lawmaking process. Wow. Uh, there was, you mentioned, uh, another couple of conflicting forces. Uh, I've been in academia before, um, and I, I, I hope my colleagues uh, won't uh, take it too hard, but you know, when I'm talking about, uh, when we're talking about product innovation and you know, product development, yeah. I think uh, one of the farthest things that I can think of is uh, academia and the academic um, yeah. you know, mindset. Can yeah. you elaborate a little bit more and maybe tell us what you learned in both yeah. environments? This is something that I've struggled with, um, with the perceptions of other people in the early part of my current career, if you like, the last 10 years or so, 2012 onwards. Um, I would regularly have people saying, but sure, you are an academic. What would you know about business? And, I asked, and then my general response was, yeah, but I'm a user and a customer and a participant and a consumer and everything else as well. So, of course, I have my opinions. I do appreciate that academic research and product research and development are different things and have different focuses, and that's necessary. So we talk, for example, your, your area of expertise is artificial intelligence. That didn't start in the boardroom. That started in academia. The internet started in academia. 
So academia provides the, in my view, academia provides the mindset for people to become innovators when they go out into the real world. Um, and academic research, or what we call sometimes call blue sky research, has its purposes. Equally in product, you know, blue sky research has its purposes. Many products were invented by accident or by just giving people the opportunity to experiment, you know, try something. It's, it's kind of, you know, one of the fundamental principles of Agile. So it's not that they're fundamentally different, it's that the outcome is different. So in academia, you can research something not really caring whether it's going to be commercially successful or not. Whereas in product development, in product innovation, you have to be able to say whether it's worth doing this thing or not. And that depends on what your expected outcome is. And what about, uh, what about the, um, the mission of um, a product innovator? Because it seems like um, if you're a product owner, you know, you're subject to deadlines, milestones, releases. Uh, but from what you're saying, uh, there is a subtle difference because um, a product innovator could decide that you know, investing uh, two months uh, or, or five sprints on a feature that is very of very explorative nature might make sense, even if, you know, the risk is high. Can you comment yeah. on that? Yeah, um, and it's, it's actually the core value or the core principle that I bring into my um, agile thinking, if you like. Um, you know, I, I write about this on my blog. I've, I've talked about this to executives. You have to create a space where people are not afraid to get started on something that they just think, I've got a really good idea. I don't really want to make a fool of myself by going through the 53-step innovation documentation and sign-off process before I actually have some you know, gut instinct that this might work or might be some value. Let them give it a go. Um, I recommend to, to you know, my former clients, I do, did a lot of agile transformations, and I recommend to former clients that they should allow 10 to 20% of sprint capacity for, um, un, let's say, unspecified activities. That can be bug fixes, that often is the case, but where that, that scope is available, I, I used to have a rule with one of my clients that uh, every developer had the right to take one thing into the back, in, from the backlog into the sprint that the product owner couldn't object to. So developers would put things onto the backlog that they wanted to do. That, that causes innovation to happen, it's just by accident. Or, accident but you know but um, organically i guess so yeah the, the, sorry the, just to finish that point the idea that there is no place in agile for experimentation is a problem of processes not mindsets yeah 100 percent, i agree uh, from your privileged position um have you witnessed a shift in um, the attitude of stakeholders towards uh, innovation in product like you were mentioning um you know injecting some uh, randomness in uh, you know a very yeah. rigid set of processes do you think now uh, stakeholders are a little bit more uh, risk uh, takers do you do they perceive risk uh, and the reward associated to it better than uh, 10 years ago yes 100 percent. but that doesn't mean it's a perfect panacea. Um, I, I always believed that organizations, so people perceive risk depend, best, best, best depending on where they are. So you can't identify something that I might consider risky. You, don't, you, know, you, you have to see through my eyes to understand whether I consider something risky or not. And that's well known from things like stock market investments and so on. Organizations see risk from their own perspective. And small, agile, entrepreneurial organizations see risk as attractive, appealing, an opportunity, a disruptor. And large organizations that have boards of directors and shareholders that are pension funds and insurance companies, for example, might think, yeah, I don't really know if this is a good idea to be seen to be taking this risk. And that doesn't mean they don't. What it might mean sometimes is, I've seen this, they will either do it internally and maybe not publish the, uh, the results if they're, they're not good, or they might maybe offshore the risk to a startup or a spin out or you know, joint venture or something like that. So there is an appetite for experimentation, innovation, and it really depends on who you are in the organization and what, side, what kind of an organization it is to you know, to know whether it's visible or not. 
It's certainly more than it was 10 years ago, but that, sorry to cut across you, that, but yeah, definitely more than it was 10 years ago, but that's by necessity rather than decision. Do you think the uh, potential reward associated to risky projects, and here, you know, this is a, you know, risky is a very nice topic because it allows me to introduce into this discussion artificial intelligence because, you know, a lot of our clients actually, you know, they're kind of um, wary and concerned because they see the yep. potential value, but they can also see the very high risk of failure because yep. what we are doing with AI uh, is something that um, hasn't done before. And uh, some of the problems that we are trying to tackle with AI sometimes don't have a real solution and we yep. discover it too late. Yep. So what, what's your take on this? And um, you know, if you can comment a little bit more about about AI and, or, and risk and perceived risk. Um, so perceived risk, as I said, is, is it's a bit like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Um, you know, for me, the only thing that's risky is the thing you don't do. Um, the thing you don't do is pretty much guaranteed to fail. So there's no risk of it being successful. Um, if there's, if there's an opportunity to do something, to try something, to experiment with something that may have some upside, well, my advice is always, well, limit the downside. If that means it's a joint venture or it's a spin out or it's a, a single sprint or if it's a spike in a sprint or if, in fact, if it's a two hour workshop, that alone can be enough sometimes to, to mitigate risk or, um, you know, to make people feel comfortable about the risk. For example, sometimes the risk is, could be is this feasible for us using our technologies and the tour our workshop with the right technological people can tell you whether it is or not suddenly that risk is gone so i tend to, to see risks as almost like uh, markers or check boxes you know things to things to say well have we checked this will work have we checked this is suitable have we checked there's some value here um, if you've got all the answers the risks are mitigated but it comes back to the, the, the first point i made if you don't try anything you're guaranteed not to succeed if you try something potentially guaranteed to well sorry i rephrase that you're, you're guaranteed that you'll get an answer you might succeed you might fail but with, you don't try anything you'll always say oh, what if um my my catchphrase of motto whatever you want to call it is that um we're not afraid of failure right we're not but the consequences of failure if we're afraid of failure none of us will be able to walk because the amount of times we fell down while we were learning how to walk humans are not afraid of failure we learn from our failures, but we have to be in an environment where we can. Now, to go back to the question about AI and the perceived risk of AI, I think the, the, the problem with AI is it, it's facing into the same problem that all innovative technologies faced into, in that everybody's afraid to spend big money on something that might be a waste. And so I'm only as of today, I had a conversation with an organization who should remain nameless, um, because it's a private conversation between two companies, but it was about, we would like to be able to do this. Do you think you could? And their answer was, well, we're not sure, but we were able to do something like it. Okay, that mitigated the risk for me. So let's now move on to the next part of the conversation. But it will be a very small project, small as in maybe two sprints, half a development team. That's small for a large organization. And something like that, then you, at the end of it, you say, okay, this seems like it might have some value. Let's move on or else it doesn't. So you're always mitigating the risk, always using milestones and so on. With AI, it can appear from the outsider that this is a huge big behemoth of a massive multi-year project that we have to implement, and we've no idea whether it's going to get anything. As I said, I had a conversation this morning with an organization where we probably spend, you know, not much more than, than a large organization's lunch budget, and we will know whether AI is any, of any value to them. Um, so it, it is an opportunity, but also a blocker for AI um, providers, let's say. My, my under, underlying kind of message to AI providers would be stop talking about the AI and start talking about the problem. I think from what you're saying, uh, you know, there are ways to mitigate the risk associated to AI. One of them is to uh, time bound uh, uh, the yep. projects and define the projects in the right way. I, I suspect that, you know, you're an academic, ex-academic, so you you are very well acquainted with the, you know, scientific method. Yep. So there are a list of hypotheses. Uh, we're going to essentially make, make experiments to test yep. these hypotheses. Some of them uh, will fail. Some others will succeed. But yep. 
at the end of the day, in any case, we will learn. Okay. Yes. I imagine that, you know, you get it. I get it because I did research for many years, but it is, I imagine, hard uh, to convince people that are not, um, they don't have that learning process in place, uh, yeah. you know, to invest money on, you know, these speculative um, activities that essentially can bring learnings into the company, but not tangible, you know, m measurable outcomes. What do you think? Yeah. So interesting that I had this conversation maybe three or four weeks ago with somebody who referred to one of my previous academic papers back in the day. Um, and we were talking about the, the purpose of publishing that paper and because that paper was for an experiment that failed and it, it was probably eight months worth of work. Um, and it proved that the thing I wanted to achieve was not possible to achieve the way I wanted it to. Um, as a result of that paper being published, a colleague that I had no interaction with read the paper, arranged a conversation, came up with an entirely new idea. And that resulted in my research masters, his PhD, two patents and a blockchain being invented Wow! because of something that we said failed. So I'm going to say blockchain, I have to be careful here because the definition of blockchain has changed in the last 10 years, but it was a, a, a block using the blockchain characteristics in audio signals. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that all of those opportunities came out of a failure. Um, whether they su were successes or not is almost irrelevant. They were other opportunities. So failures can lead to other opportunities. Um, in recent, so let's say the last five years or so, there's been a lot of really good publications on innovation in Agile and so on. Things like, I mean, there's an old, the old classic is the Lean Startup. Um, mm -hmm. But things like Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Um, last yep. year, Be Less Zombie by Elvin Turner. Um, the, the Lean Product Owner's Guide, things like that are starting to make business people think in terms of small experiments to validate learning, validate assumptions, take validated learnings, and maybe pivot um, to new opportunities. It's a slow process in large organizations, but it is happening. Um, so the experimental mindset is now starting to be accepted, at least in my experience, it's starting to be accepted as something that is useful, even if the outcome of it is not a product that can be put onto a KPI. If I, if I look at, again, go back to my own research papers, I think I published nine papers and only two of them, well, I, only two of them were about things that failed, but they were learning. If you look at a, an organization that creates new opportunity, new products all the time, some of them are going to fail. So the key is not to say we're not going to fail. The key is to say, what do we do when we fail? And then we, what we do is we publish. And that means, you know, for an organization that could mean internally, here's something we tried, it didn't work. If nothing else, it will save the rest of the organization trying it again now or in the future. That's a learning. I suspect that what, what makes the difference between a good innovator and a not so great innovator is um, the ability to succeed uh, more often uh, than, uh, uh, than, um, you know, than it, when it fails or uh, to win big when you win and um, you know, capitalize on those failures with those um, um, yeah, tangential wins. So it's a little bit like marketing in the end. Uh, you know, you don't know, you don't know, you know it worked. You know that if you don't do marketing, you know that um, you know yeah. sales are gonna suffer. But yeah. if you do a lot of marketing, you don't exactly know what is, you know, how much is working and you know when yeah. it will uh, you, you will capitalize. So I imagine that innovation in, and you know when it comes to AI, it's it's even more tricky. But I imagine that it's a little bit like the same paradigm. What do you think? Interesting. You, you, you referred to something that we, I don't know if this, this translates into Italian, but we say in England, in English, if you throw enough spaghetti at the wall, some of it will stick. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard this uh, metaphor before, but basically that's the well, scattergun approach, you know? Um, and is yes, if you do enough things, something will have an effect. The, qu the question then is, well, what, was, what caused that effect? And if we think of the scientific method, you're thinking, okay, one parameter change, one effect. Different parameter change, different effect. Okay, so I know the parameters have an impact. But if you change 100 parameters or you only do an experiment once, you've no idea what caused uh, the end result. Having said that, I actually think what makes a good innovator is somebody who's not embarrassed to fail repeatedly. Uh, my favorite, uh, most people would think of people like um, you know, Elon Musk or whatever. For me, it's Richard Branson. Um, Richard Branson's quite happy to be the face of something that may or may not have succeeded. Most recent Virgin Cruises, Virgin Airlines, Virgin Records, 
going to the moon. You don't put your face in front of a, a weird idea if you're afraid it might fail and make you look embarrassed. Mm. And so I think for me, anyway, my personal uh, recommendation for anybody who wants to be the innovator evangelist is don't be afraid to look like an idiot because it's going to happen quite a lot. So for me, that's whether it be a company or an individual, fear of failure and how you look in the eyes of other people is actually something you just have to accept. Again, I'll go back to the point though, I don't consider it failure. In, in my uh, previous role, we essentially, we put the hatchet to three different projects uh, in a week mm-hmm. and it was considered a great success because those projects had been bubbling along for probably two years. And no, everybody was afraid to say they're not going anywhere. But what we did was we had a, an inquest for each of them. What did we learn from this? What can we take from this? And that led to a new way of thinking. So again, it comes back to never see anything as a failure. They're just ended. And what about different cultures and the way in which failure is perceived? Like, you know, I imagine that in your career, you've seen the Americans, you've seen the Europeans. Within the Europeans, you've seen the attitude of Italians, for instance, versus, yeah. you know, the, the uh, British or French. Can you, can you tell us if you found any meaningful differences? Yes, um, but not in so much the, 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 the reaction to different cultures to failure, but reaction to different cultures and how they present failure. Mm. So, you know, a, a scientist would present failure as a positive outcome to an unexpected question. <laughs> you know, it's just, we asked, we got an answer, but we just, it wasn't a question we asked. So it's how you present it. Um, somebody who, you know, st- did it, you know, started up a business and didn't go anywhere with it and then started another one and didn't go anywhere with it. They present their failures, as you call them that, as stepping stones or learning opportunities or, you know, trial runs or whatever. They're, they're presented differently. In businesses that are open to innovation, especially forward-thinking businesses, a lot of businesses are only just catching up, but forward-thinking mm-hmm. businesses that are open to innovation that they are promoting rather than reacting to, they tend to present failures as, you know, let's produce a report, let's learn from it, let's disseminate that information And then let's try again. Um, so let's make sure we don't make the same mistake again. So culturally, I don't think individuals um, can, you know, can have any impact on how their potential failures are, mm-hmm. are seen, except by how they present them. Uh, I wonder, do you think that at the end of the day, this uh, innovation is a numbers game where, you know, the more money you pour in, the better the higher is the likelihood of um, getting something that's... I don't think it comes down to money, Luca. I think it comes down to uh, individual experiments or individual attempts or individual um, efforts, if you want to call it that. Um, you, you could put you know, $10 million dollars into one project. That's not where I wouldn't think that's going to give you the same level of output, learning output, as 100 grand into you know, 1,000 products. Um, it's you know, because that 100 grand can tell you whether 99 of those products are going to work or not. And sometimes we've seen it with Uber, we've seen it with Dropbox, we've seen it with all of these you know, massively disruptive platforms. They were invented on a, a spit and a prayer. Um, you know, Uber's first app didn't actually have an app. It had somebody on the end of a phone calling your local taxi office, but it proved that the product would, would, would um, be successful. Dropbox, when it, when it was marketing, didn't actually have a product. But people were signing up and filling in forms and giving all their information, including their email addresses, and adding themselves to a wait list. That told Dropbox it was worth actually developing the product, with no, almost no expenditure at all. So it's not the, the number of dollars, it's the number of projects. Okay, interesting. And, uh, you know, in the last 12 months, uh, and now I'm quoting uh, the uh, economist of a couple of weeks ago, At the big five tech, and I'm talking about Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, and Microsoft, have invested 53% of their cash flow in R&D and capital expenditure. Yep. Why is that? Why do you think, uh, I mean, they're putting so much? Um, I, I'd say it's a combination of two, two reasons. First of all, it's because they have the cash. and There's very little else okay. you can do to make a return on it. Um, and secondly, because those organizations live in a world of constant innovation. You know, they're, they're not, um, they don't, for example, they don't make tires for cars. Tires for cars haven't changed much in 100 years. Um, and the kind of innovations that you see in tires for cars, you or I would never even notice. A racing driver might, but you or I would never even notice. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, it was only when I moved to Italy that I learned there was such a thing as winter tires. <laughs> so I wasn't allowed to drive into Italy until I got my tires changed because it was the middle of the winter. You know, for me, there was, there's no um, innovation within that sector. But for technology, it's a constantly innovating sector. And I heard somebody, um, I don't know who it was recently, it was, I was just listening to a commentary, and he described innovation as standing still. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting because if you're a large organization and you think you're innovating, you're probably miles behind the curve and just about standing still. In other words, if you're not innovating, you're going backwards. And so, I you know, I'd say, that, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, I imagine that, you know, in, for these uh, tight wars, because, you know, we're talking about Apple and Amazon and Alphabet. I mean, these guys are competing against each other for... Um, um, yeah, consumers attention and we're talking yeah. about a global war so um, every little help makes a difference right yeah uh, but also as I said it's it's because they have the money if you think about it you said that they're spending 53% globally 53% of their cash revenues on innovation and R&D if you're a startup you're spending 100% of your revenue on innovation and R&D you know so it's, it's all relative um, so you know if you have a a really cool idea. I, I did this myself. I, apart from my, you know, what I call my day job, I have had a couple of startups and spin outs of my own. And they were, they were pursued because I could see an opportunity for technology to solve a business problem. And they did, you know, they were successful in that I learned in some cases, I learned that the industry didn't care enough about the problem. Um, so yes, technology would solve the problem, but the industry didn't care enough to make to warrant it being a product. That's also an attempt at innovation that, if you look at it from a purely a business perspective, it fails. But from my point of view, it was succeeded because it meant I didn't develop a platform and then a product and then a marketing and then hire people and then find out that the industry didn't want to solve the problem. So it, it all, again, comes back down to my point earlier on that innovation or you know, problem solving, or all these things are always in the eye of the beholder, like value or anything else like that. If it's, if it's perceived as innovative, then it is. I, I wonder, we discussed about how startups are innovating, 100% of the budget, happy days. Either it, either it succeeds or we uh, fail dramatically, and that's okay. Or, you know, if you're in a, one of the big five, you know, 53% of uh, their uh, cash flow big, on R&D. What about SMEs? How do they do? How do they get innovation right? And by innovation, let's let's you know let's push towards um, you know top you know top high risk innovation. For instance, okay. AI innovation. How do they do it, and how do they get it right? More importantly, um, I think AI is it's a bit like when the internet when it came along. You know, a lot of people were saying, "What's this thing for? Why would I care? It's not used to me. I sell I sell flowers in a shop." And the first organization that I remember going fully online that was a, a high street uh, main street name was Interflora and the whole concept of an organization going from fully bricks and mortar to fully online when the internet came along everybody would have, would have said that's never going to happen you know nowadays it's online first so it's about um, with SMEs or any organization especially organizations that are, are trying to figure out well does this innovation have any real use for me or is it just something that I'm expected to spend 53% of my budget on because marketers tell me I should, or my IT guy tells me I should? Uh, it all comes down to what's the priority. Um, so mm -hmm. if, we, if we take a step back to kind of, you know, the, the world I operate in most, which is agile transformation and agile product innovation, everything is, is limited resources. And, you know, you have to prioritize, estimate your effort, estimate your return, um, and then prioritize based on that. Uh, I, always, I, I always look at these things as if I could only do one thing, if I only had mm. enough resources left to do one thing, what would it be? And to be fair, if I'm an SMA, it probably wouldn't be AI. It would probably be marketing, as you said earlier on. But then if it gets to the stage where I have the resources to do two or three things, but could one of those things be planning for the future? And if it is, is that where AI starts to come in? Uh, is that where I start to look at who's innovating how in my sector? Um, you know, my exposure to AI personally goes back a long time. Um, I, when I was lecturing at one of my 
um, exam papers for postgraduates was about what do we do if AIs become super intelligences? You know, that was, a, that was an exam question 12 years ago for software engineers. But nowadays it's a question for, um, for, for everybody to say, well, what do we mean by AI and what does it give me? It's now become um, a, a common enough phrase that when you say AI to business people, they have a fair idea what you mean. Maybe not academically correct, but they have a fair idea what you mean. The question is, what does it mean to them? And I think that's always been the problem with people who market technology. It's the IT guys might be really interested in the tech stack, but the executive aren't. You know, you need to tell them about their problems and how you're going to solve them. And if you can get that conversation going with SMEs, especially because there's so many SMEs around the place, and especially because SMEs tend to be more risk, uh, more happy to take a risk than large organizations with layers of management. Um, again, it comes down to talk about the problem, not the technology. Do you think we should, instead of mentioning AI, we should talk about scale, cutting costs, speeding up manual processes, and forget about yeah. the word AI, just focusing on yeah. you know, those missions? Uh, because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, nobody cares about the tools or the hammers, but exactly. everybody, everybody, especially in you know, uh, your position or um, uh, an executive yeah. position, cares about those three or four things that the decision will makers. have an impact on their business, right? Yeah, 100%. The decision makers who make those decisions want to know what are the, 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 the levers for them. Uh, and in fact, if you take a large organization with multiple products, you could be talking to a product manager who has an entirely different set of problems than another product manager, even in the same work stream. So it needs to be tailored, just like marketing. It needs to be tailored to the people you're talking to. Um, it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not that the technology doesn't matter, but the technology is secondary because the people who make the decisions to, to maybe follow an AI research path for a particular product or a particular, get an answer to a particular problem, they'll bring in the technical people they need when they need them. There's no point if they don't have, there's no point in, in asking, for example, to ask a, a technical architect to do a, let's say a throughput capacity bandwidth test or a, you know, a, um, what do they call a stress test on a, an AI algorithm to see if it can handle 10 trillion transactions a year when in fact you're only ever going to get 150 transactions a day. Exactly. You know, so it's always about under, marketing. Like it's, I, always, I kind of think of this as like when people market fast cars. You know, this car can do 246 miles an hour. Well, that's nice, but we're not allowed. <laughs> you know? So, you know, it's kind of, it's selling a message that nobody really can aspire to achieving. Um, 10 trillion transactions a year, you know, uh, sub, sub nanosecond response times. Well, really on my internet connection? I don't think so. <laughs> you know? So sometimes it's about tempering the, the, how cool is this new technology kind of vibe that sometimes comes across from technologists and marketers in that space and saying, you don't mind how cool it is or how fast it is or how scalable it is. You, the problem you have, I'm going to solve it. And it's going to be cheap. You know, that's, that's the, the, the thing that business people care about. Do you think uh, the metaverse is the new AI, the Kool-Aid? I, I, think, I think the metaverse is a conversation for another time, Luca. I have real concerns about the metaverse. From a GDP, I'm a, I'm, I've been in the privacy sector, so you know, I, I really am concerned about where the metaverse is going. Um, so yeah, maybe let, that's let, a conversation let, for a glass of wine. <laughs> let's keep uh, the, the metaverse for uh, this, the, other, the second, the part two of our conversation. Okay. And let's, let's go back to um, product life cycle. I'm, this is a, a question that, uh, you know, it's very interesting for me. Where do you think, again, in the product innovation life cycle, um, AI should fit? Um, let me give you a couple of um, examples that really stands, uh, um, pulls apart. Number one, company that creates a brand new product and needs an AI is at the core of that product. Okay, mm -hmm. There is a process that needs to be automated from scratch. And my entire business model is based on that, that assumption. Right. And then there is the opposite example or scenario where there is an existing product consolidated with hundreds of thousands of users, um, maybe even um, you know, quite old fashioned product that requires and need uh, some smarts on a killer feature that maybe is, uh, you know, kind of copied from uh, a competitive uh, mm -hmm. um, company. And I imagine that in these two scenarios, actually, uh, I experienced myself, it's a completely different story, right? For yep. 
AI getting introduced into that company and then for the AI percolating inside that, those two different products. Can you comment on that? Um, I think you can say that that's true for anything, not just AI. Um, you know, I've had recent uh, clients where they were switching to um, event-driven architecture. It's nothing to do with AI, but there were same conversations were going on. You know, this is an entirely different technological architecture. How does it impact on what we're already doing? Can we leverage this new technology for innovations or optimizations elsewhere? Um, you know, is it, the, the event driven architecture was brought in for a very specific product. And so the question then became, is it just for that product or is it for everything? Should we now look at this as a new tool in their toolbox? And that was, a, that was an interesting sp space to be in because a lot of people would be technical people who have a certain way of thinking about things can sometimes be blind to the new way of doing old things. And, um, you know, they, and, and, you know, maybe there's a certain gatekeeper mentality and a certain reluctance for change and, and so on. But if the organization has an open, you know, widely known open culture for discussing innovation, proposing mm -hmm. innovations, those people might, a bit, might be more likely to say, no, I think I should dedicate a little bit of my development time to seeing what use this is to us. To go back to your, the, the start of the question about where should AI be brought into the conversation. In fact, I don't think AI should ever be seen as something outside the conversation. In the same way that we would never say, when should the internet be brought into the conversation? You know, if you're talking about e-commerce, for example, you would never say, mm. when do we bring the internet into the conversation? We don't. It's already in the conversation. Yeah. It's just a tool to achieve an end goal. And I see the same... Uh, I have the same mindset for all technologies. If they achieve a goal, they are the right technology. If you find another technology that achieves the goal, then it's a better technology. Not right or wrong, better. Um, so um, I think, again, if, if the right people know about what AI can do, and this is, I think, is where the limitations are, the right people know about what AI can do from a business perspective, then it's always going to be in the back of their mind. Um, solution architects, business architects, enterprise architects, product owners, product managers, they won't be saying, oh, I wonder, should I think about AI for this? You know, if they know what AI can do, they'll already be thinking about AI. One of the, the approaches I take to disruptive type, uh, approaches, uh, disruptive technologies, let's say, um, I did this, I started this in one of my own businesses. And what I did was I had a few ideas of what the, the companies in my sector, the, the target sector mm -hmm. wanted. And I had a product defined that would solve those problems. When I started talking to those customers, those potential customers, they started telling me other problems that they had. So I, I started to think, well, could I fit those other problems into my solution, right? Which is obviously what you do in product innovation. But then I started to use those questions, those answers as questions to other people. So in, in, the, in the end, I produced a sort of document outlining all the problems that this technology could solve. But not one of them mentioned what the technology was. They were all about the problems the technology could solve. In the end, it was, 55 different problems in one sector from one piece very of technology. powerful yeah and they're all very very small problems but when you list them together that's a lot of power from one product so again it comes back to solve the problem tell me what problem you're, you're going to solve me for for me and how easy it is i suspect that you know we're nicely um you know, navigating towards um, at the end of uh, this very interesting conversation. And before, you know, we wrap up, I, I still have a couple of questions. And sure. one of them is very important because it's about the barriers um, that inevitably are uh, encountered when uh, you are trying to deploy AI in um, an existing product or, you know, embrace AI in a new company. Uh, so here I would like to hear from you, from your experience, a little bit more about what these barriers are. Because to be honest, in my experience, there are all sorts of thing, things that emerge. You know, you're talking to a financial services player, and number one is privacy concerns, data sharing, um, people that are, I mean, regulation, of course, uh, bias. Uh, but then um, uh, there are, you know, other kind of um, obstacles you know you think uh, about um, a manufacturer and uh, here you have people working with uh, robots and working with your AI so there is a there is a level of um, uh, interaction that needs to be managed uh, people need to know how the AI behave and know yeah. how they have to know how they have to behave uh, to maximize productivity so there are there's all sort of 
potential barriers. Uh, yeah. What I'm interested to know is um, in what case it is worth um, you know, trying to attack those barriers uh, and um, try to overcome to those obstacles. Because to be blunt and honest, some of my clients say, no, it's not worth it. It's too much, a, too much of an asset. Yeah. So what do you think? Um, again, as boring as it sounds, AI is not unique in, in that problem, right? All new technologies face similar barriers to entry or barriers to acceptance. Um, mm -hmm. If you can answer questions before they're asked, that's always um, that's always a really um, powerful way of approaching a conversation. If you can say to customers or potential customers, we kind of know the questions you're going to ask because most people have the same questions and we've answered them. Um, so if you focus then, what that does is it deflects the attention away from the obvious questions. Things like you said about privacy, about, for example, using anonymization to avoid the, the privacy issue, the data exchange issue or using tokenization or whatever. People, you know, when they have a question, they have a fair idea of what they think an acceptable answer would be. So if you've already got those answers as part of your conversation, it means that you can start to focus on the things that matter to that customer that aren't general. And I think most customers, most business people accept that innovation and change is a given, it's, a, it's happening. The question for most of them is, well, when do I have to do it? Or when does it make sense for me to do it? And that really, I think, is the conversation that, that proponents of new technologies should be having. Not, and I've heard this myself, actually. I've been in a, in a meeting with an executive group where, um, careful how I say this, where a salesperson um, for a new way of doing te certain things uh, technology-wise was telling these guys that they're all going to be left behind by their competitors. And this was uh -huh. obviously part of a spiel. What he'd forgotten was these guys were the public sector. They didn't have competitors. You know, it wasn't, they were, yes, they were using the same technologies and the same platforms, but they didn't care about competitors. You know, they weren't, they weren't fighting for the same dollars. So you kind of have to be in a position where you can get to the customer's main, um, you know, their own personal pain points, let's say. Um, but sometimes I find that you, do, you can do that quickest by saying, well, look, here's the common pain points that everybody has. And the customer can maybe pre-read them on the website and, you know, marketing collateral or whatever and say, oh, okay, they've thought of these five things that I would have asked and they're answered. Now I can focus on the, the other things that they haven't answered. Then it becomes more personal. And then again, boring as it is, go back to the problem. What's the problem you're trying to solve? How can I solve it? And how quickly? Excellent. Thanks. This is, you know, this is a, this is a very crucial topic because whenever there is a, a friction and barriers to innovation, there is a missed opportunity, I think. Oh yeah. And, um, um, yeah, that's that's the kind of opportunities. I mean, those AI opportunities are the ones that you don't want to miss. I think. But anyway, yeah. let's let's uh, uh, let's um, now attack a different topic. Um, I think um, you know it is um, it is a topic that a, it has very little to do with innovation. Um, it's more about you know what's happening at the moment in the world. Uh, I get very frustrated at the moment because everybody is uh, uh, talking about the nuclear threat and uh, nuclear technology to achieve a uh, political, social, socio-economical socio supremacy. And I get very frustrated because, um, I mean, that technology in practical terms cannot be used. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it can be threatened to be used, but um, if somebody uses it, it's the end for everybody. So yeah. I don't see how in practical terms, um, yeah, unconventional weapons and the nuclear technology can be used to achieve that purpose. Uh, do you think that ultimate, uh, the ultimate um, technology and tool for um, supremacy, global supremacy, is uh, AI? Well, that's an interesting segue. <laughs> um, that's really interesting. You know, I, I, was, I was kind of thinking as you, were, as you were leading the question, I was thinking, this is why we call it the nuclear option, right? When, when we, people talk about the nuclear option, it means everything's gone. Every, everything's exploded, right? So it's not something anybody wants to do. AI has a slightly different brand image, I guess you'd call it. Um, you know, people who remember like movies like iRobot or going back further, anybody who's read Isaac Asimov or, or whatever, you know, AI is, and actually in the 70s and 80s, we were told that AI was going to take over the world and we were all going to become its slaves. Um, so people of my generation, um, maybe not so much younger, younger generation, but certainly people of my generation would have grown up with that um, combination of Big Brother is watching you and AI is going to tell you what to do. Um, 
we haven't quite reached that, but we're having we're not that far off it either. Um, most fiction is a precursor of a future of some sort. Um, so we haven't we have kind of reached there. We we know there are cases where AI has been used to change voting patterns, for example. Um, but what I will say is, for me, and people who know me will have heard me say this repeatedly, there is no such thing as bad technology. Technology just is. Technology doesn't do things good or bad. People do. So, you know, it's it's all about making sure we have processes and, and checkpoints in place to make sure that we don't let things get out of hand. Now, what I will say is, rightly or wrongly, and whether it could be avoided is questionable, but the internet really hasn't been policed properly, um, especially mm. in, once it became a commercially systematic, a systemic um, platform. I do, I'm a big firm believer in free speech, but not at the expense of other people. You know, so there's a, there's a certain element of where society has to draw its lines and the law is usually that, that there for that reason. When I back, I'm, I'll go back to when I was, when I was, um, I mentioned this earlier when I was lecturing my postgraduate students and the exam question was about the super intelligence. Um, there was actually at the time, so we're, at, we're talking, let's say 2010, 2011. Already the technologies for artificial intelligence, quantum computing, biochemical computing, nanotechnology, and self-replicating machines were already pretty mature. And so the exam question I wrote, maybe a little bit unfair, but the exam question I wrote was, if you take, if you use these, sec these technologies, we are essentially capable of creating an entirely new um, sentient, self-replicating and super intelligent life form, should we? You know, that's really a, a, a question that we should have asked about artificial intelligence and the internet and nuclear technology and so on, but we don't. What we do is we wait until these are invented and say, okay, well, now we should regulate them. So I don't see artificial intelligence as being the end of all cre uh, creation, but I do think that it needs a lot of tight regulation, especially if it gets to the stage where we have quantum computing and super intelligence is that exactly. you know, Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics are not going to be a problem for a quantum machine. Yeah, and it's, this is where I, I, I was actually thinking to go with our conversation because, um, as you know, AI is um, a CPU and resource hungry. Uh, I think quantum computing will uh, fulfill that hunger uh, yeah. to an extent that is, uh, for me, unimaginable. Like if we had a quantum computer able to really, um, you know, run uh, the AI algorithms that we're currently and expensively, I must say, uh, run on uh, Amazon GPUs. Yeah. Well, that would be a different, a completely different game. And it's not surprising that you know the big financial institutions are going big on quantum computing because um, let's think about, for instance, algorithmic trading. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a that's a, that's a speed game, right? So it's yeah. like Formula One. Yeah, yeah. If you are the fastest, you win everything. So the winner yeah. takes all. So this is a you know quantum computing is a is an area of research that we are uh, watching carefully because uh, the minute it will start uh, to deliver, uh, it's going to be interesting. But again, yeah. I, you know, it's, I imagine the, the nature of regulators, right? You're an expert. Regulators, I mean, first the damage is done and then regulator comes and fixes it, right? So it's a, it's a, it's a retroactive um, yeah. um, activity, I imagine. It's yeah. not predictive. It's, we go, it can you be. Go, Fine. You know, I think all, um, so we talk about regulation and legislation, but in, in the end, they are, they are processes for formalizing what previously societies did amongst themselves. They agreed on norms and behaviors and what's acceptable and what the punishment would be. Um, so I don't, I don't think they're necessarily proactive or retroactive. I think they're continuously evolving. Um, mm. You know, so some people would have seen, for example, go back to GDPR, some people would have seen GDPR as the start of something, whereas other people would have seen it as the end of something else. Similarly, with Payment Services Directive, Payment Services Directive now, uh, part two now, instant payments, the, the end of something, the start of something else, entirely new problems come along, entirely new things have to be regulated. For example, how do we regulate push payment fraud in PSD2? We can't, because it's a bit like me handing you 100 euros cash in the street and you walking away. I can't come after you and say, I'll go to a regulator or you know a police enforcement of some sort and say, I need you to get that back. We can't. So we have to accept that the world has changed. Regulators have to be very careful because what they do is they paint with a very broad brush. 
And regulators can either promote or stifle innovation and adaptation of regulations without even thinking about it. You know, the, you know, the, the, con the concept of law of unintended consequences. Um, it's, there are thousands of examples of the law of unintended consequences. So regulators have to be very careful, which is the reason why regulations tend to be very vague. Uh, so they'd be left to the courts to interpret or each country to interpret. Um, so it, it, I don't think it should be down to the regulators to preempt somebody doing something bad with technology. Go back to Formula One, because you mentioned Formula One. I'm a big fan of Formula One. Um, the regulators in Formula One changed the rules for pit stops because Red Bull were too fast using their technology. So the regulators retroactively leveled the playing field. True, they couldn't undo anything that was done before that, but now what happens is the participants in the game try another rule or another bend or another twist or another loophole. That's the evolution of regulation. It's a constantly evolving thing. Regulators, by definition, have to be behind reality because otherwise they don't know how society want them to regulate. And um, a, a very, um, very final question on this. So are, is, is your present and your future in regulation? Are you still, are you still enjoying the, the um, yeah. uh, innovating within, uh, within this uh, area? Yeah, as I said at the start of the conversation, it does seem like a strange combination, but it's what gives me my niche, I guess. Um, you know, if people see regulatory change coming on the horizon, I'm one of the, one of the first people to get called, which is good. Um, Wonderful. But, um, you know, for example, for me, looking at AI over the last two, three, four months, as I have been, um, just learn, relearning what I thought I knew about AI, for example, because what I knew about AI is 10, 15 years old. Mm. Um, you know, relearning what you can do with natural language speech processing and, and things like that. Um, these are all, for me, constantly constant learning opportunities. And there's always going to be regulatory change, always. Um, in fact, more so in the future, not less. Um, also, some countries are more mature in their regulation implementation and others are not. You know, so the EU is particularly mature and particularly proactive. But then what the EU does, other territories follow. Um, also, it gives other territories the courage to, to make their own proactive, independent regulatory change when they see that they could potentially be adopted by other countries as well. So, uh, yeah, for me, it's, it's almost a no brainer. I don't think anything is as, as, as really weird as it sounds. I don't think anything is more uh, appealing than using regulations to say to executives, you have to do this. No one's going to tell you how. Yeah, it's just it's also a way to you know, level things uh, on a massive global scale uh, yeah. or at least at, on a country scale. So while well, we started with innovation, we talked about AI, Agile. Um, we even mentioned nuclear weapons and regulations. Um, very final question for you, Ron. If um, our audience want to reach out, where can they find you? Okay, so they can find me on LinkedIn. It's probably the most common place anybody finds me. Um, so just search for my name on LinkedIn, and it's um, I'm one of the few with the same name, so it should be easy enough. Um, and you also mentioned that you have you have a blog, right? I have a blog, yeah, RonHealy.wordpress.com. Um, and if anybody wants to contact me directly for you know something specific, then Ron at Sakoda.ie, and Sakoda is spelled as it is on screen there. So Ron oh, at Sakoda.ie. Ron, really, listen, thanks a lot. You've been very generous with your time. Thanks for being with us. It was a terrific thank conversation. You. So um, uh, thank you again. No problem. And no problem uh, guys, yes, uh, you will see in the next episode. Thank you very much to everybody.